Again, there's a lesson in this. It only takes a few to stir up trouble. That's why God says to mark those who cause strife. Look at Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. I am so excited, and I want to get you as excited as I am. I want you to look around and see all these empty seats. See all those empty seats? That excites me. And let me tell you why it does. I see empty seats as opportunities to fill them with non-church people. Our mission statement is to convert non-Christians and nominal Christians into fully devoted followers of Christ. Non-Christians are people who don't know Jesus and they don't go to church. Nominal Christians are those who have experienced Jesus. They've received him as their Lord and Savior, but they've fallen away. They're not going to church. They're not living the way they should be living. And God's called us to convert them into fully devoted followers of Christ. And one of the things that we want here and have always wanted is a culture of people inviting those who don't know Jesus or maybe fallen away from Jesus. We want to invite them to the church because we have the answers. Let me tell you, we're a teaching ministry. And the teaching ministry brings forth the things of God from His Word. In fact, the Bible refers to it as treasure. In this Word, there's new treasure and there's old treasure. The old things are those things that everyone knows about, but it's still good to hear. The new treasures are those nuggets that you dig in and find. So get excited as we do Cornerstone Sunday and we continue to build the culture of inviting non-churched people to our services. Anyways, six weeks ago, I began a new series on the Apostle Paul. And I started off in week one by giving you some basic background information such as Paul's place of birth, his ancestry, his childhood, and his education. In week two, we talked about Paul being a Pharisee. In week three, we dug a little bit deeper into Paul's background to find out why he persecuted the church. Most of us have no understanding as to why he persecuted the church and wanted to kill early Christians. So we just dug a little bit deeper and we found out why. In week four, we studied Paul's conversion experience on the road to Damascus. And last week, we looked at the years that Paul spent in Arabia preparing for his calling as a missionary. You see, Paul was a very educated man. He had most, if not all, of the Tanakh memorized. Can you imagine that? And when I say Tanakh, if you're not familiar with that, that's actually the Torah, the writings, and the prophets what we would consider to be the entire Old Testament. In fact, he had the majority of the Old Testament memorized. But what he lacked was an understanding of how Jesus fulfilled the law and fulfilled the Messianic prophecies. So if you would, look with me in Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me Actually, that should have been translated by me, is not after man. In other words, he's not teaching such as the followers of Confucius did. Confucius' teachings are the teachings of a man or Buddhist teaching. What he's telling you is what I preached. It's not of man. I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, the phrase of Jesus Christ is written in such a way that it can be translated as either objective genitive or a subjective genitive. If you translate it as an objective genitive, it means that the divine revelation that Paul received was all about Jesus. Yeah. If you translate it as a subjective genitive, it means that the divine revelation that Paul received was from Jesus. So which is it? Is it an objective genitive or a subjective genitive? Well, believe it or not, it's both. That's why it's written in a way that it can be translated as one or the other. But what it's meant to do is to show us that it's both. So the divine revelation that Paul received in Arabia was both from Jesus, and about Jesus. In fact, it was much like what happened on the road to Emmaus, except it was much more in depth. How many of you remember the story on the road to to Emmaus? After the crucifixion, and the 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ, two men were walking to the village of Emmaus. As they were walking there, suddenly another man appeared. And he wanted to know why they were so sad. And they said, have you not heard? The one that we thought was the Messiah was rejected and was crucified and were a mourning. Of course, they didn't recognize that the person who asked that question was Jesus. And I wonder if the reason they didn't uh, recognize him as Jesus is because they were so depressed or was it because he was bearing the scars? I don't know. But while they were walking, Jesus began explaining how the scriptures prophesied about his death, burial, and resurrection. Look at Luke chapter 24, verses 25 through 27. Then Jesus said to them on the road to Emmaus, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Listen to me. We translate prophecy literally. Why do we do that? Because Jesus rebuked those who didn't. You see, prophecy clearly predicts the future. And the only way that it can clearly predict it is if it's, if it's actually um, translated literally or interpreted literally. You don't have to have some secret knowledge. All you have to do is read what the prophecies say and what you'll find is Jesus fulfilled them literally. Now, if Jesus fulfilled all the messianic prophecies literally the first time he appeared, don't you think that he's going to fulfill all the messianic prophecies literally the second time he appears? Yes. So, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to translate the prophecies literally. And that's why Jesus is rebuking them. He says, wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And this is what what uh, Jesus did with Paul in Arabia, except it was much more in depth than it was on the road to Emmaus. Now, notice the difference this revelation made in Paul's preaching. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 22. Saul's preaching became, it didn't start off that way. Why? Because he didn't have the revelation that Jesus gave him. It wasn't until he went to Arabia and received it from Jesus. But notice it says, Saul's preaching became more and more powerful. And the Jews in Damascus could not refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. And that's what we studied last week. This morning, we're going to study Paul's first missionary journey. Now, we covered a little bit of it last week, but we didn't get very far. In fact, I just started on it when we ran out of time. So hopefully we're going to move a little bit quicker this morning and cover all the places that he went on his first missionary journey. So let's start where it all began, which was the city of Antioch in Syria. During a prayer meeting, the Holy Spirit spoke to the church leaders and instructed them to lay hands on Paul and Barnabas in recognition of their calling as missionaries. Look at Acts chapter 13, verses 2 and 3, and you'll see what, I was, what I'm talking about. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work wherein to I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So, Paul and Barnabas began their first missionary journey by going to the coastal town of Seleucia, and sailing off to Cyprus. Now, Cyprus was not unfamiliar territory. The gospel had previously been preached in Cyprus, according to Acts eleven nineteen, and the church in Antioch of Syria had been started by men from, from Cyprus. And on top of that, Barnabas himself was from Cyprus. Now, the first thing that Paul and Barnabas did in Cyprus was they stopped at the synagogues in Salamis to preach. Look at Acts chapter 13, verse number 5, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. There in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues. Notice that it's plural. Salamis was a pretty large city. In fact, it was probably the largest city in Cyprus, 
Even Paphos, which was the capital, was not as large as Salamis. And because of its size, it had more than one synagogue. So they went to the Jewish synagogues and they preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. Do you see that? They preached the word of God in the synagogues. And that was Paul's method of operation. That was his method of evangelism. He didn't go to the street corners. He didn't go to the marketplace. He went to the synagogues. He always went to the synagogues first whenever he entered into a new city. Then from Salamis, Paul and Barnabas went to Paphos. Paphos was a city on the west side of the island of Cyprus. Take a look at the map on the back wall, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. They sailed from Antioch in Syria. Now notice that this is Syria. So they traveled from Antioch to Seleucia, sailed down to Salamis, which is on the east side of the island, and it's 160 miles long. So after they preached in the synagogues in Salamis, they then traveled, they walked to Paphos, which is on the west side of the island. And it was there that they encountered a false prophet. There was a Jew there by the name of Bar-Jesus. Now, in Greek, it's pronounced Bar-Jesus, Bar meaning son. So he's the son of Jesus, which is what we would say as Jesus or Joseph, all right? Sometimes Joshua. But he, there was a Jew whose name was, surname was, Bar-Jesus, who was also called Elimus. Now, in English, we pronounce it Elimus, but in Greek, it's not. It's Elimus. The sorcerer. Now, somehow, he had become an important advisor to the governor, Sergius Paulus. And he was afraid that if Paul and Barnabas were persuaded to become Christians, then he would lose his influence. So he sought to prevent Sergius Paulus from hearing the gospel. Turn to Acts chapter 13, verses 6 through 11, and we're going to read the story. I'm going to stop as I go through this to expound a little bit on it. But notice what it says starting in verse 6. Afterward, they preached from town to town across the entire island. Why? Because they had to go by foot, travel by foot from Salamis across Cyprus to get to Paphos. And along the way, they stopped at all the little towns. Now, Cyprus is 160 miles long. So again, as they were traveling from east to west, they went through all of these little towns and villages, and in each town, Paul stopped to preach in the synagogues. Now let's keep reading. He, who's he? The false prophet, Elimus, had attached himself to the governor, Sergius Paulus, a man of considerable insight and understanding. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Saul and Barnabas said. He was trying to turn the governor away from the Christian faith. Then Saul, kind of love this about Saul. Saul had a choleric personality. I love that. You want to know why? <laughs> I have a very choleric personality. And Paul could be very snarky. And I love that. You want to know why? Because I can be very snarky. Then Saul, also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked the sorcerer in the eye and said, You son of the devil, full of every sort of trickery and villainy, enemy of all that is good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? And why can he say this to him? Because he was a Jew. He knew better. The Mosaic law prohibits sorcery of any kind. And now the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, and you will be stricken a while, in other words, temporarily, with blindness. Instantly. In Greek that means immediately. Mist and darkness fell upon him. And he began wandering around, feeling begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. Now, of course, as I've already stated, Elimus was a false prophet. So Paul decided to show him what a true prophet of God could do. So he said, you will be stricken a while. In other words, for a temporary period of time with blindness. He said that in verse number 11. Now, remember, 
if someone is a true prophet of God, everything they pro proclaim will come to pass. And if it doesn't come to pass, what does the Old Testament tell us? What does Deuteronomy tell us? They're not a true prophet of God. That's why God had to take Elijah. Because Elijah kind of got out of control. Elijah would say, if I be a man of God, and he would call something down to happen, and he's a true prophet of God. So God had to honor that, but God said, okay, you're starting to get out of control. That's not the way I intended it to be. And, of course, he takes him up in a chariot of fire. Elijah's there. He witnesses. He gets a double portion, but he's got it in control. But here Paul is. He does the very same thing. You pretend to be. You're a false prophet. I'm going to show you what a true prophet of God is. He says, this is what's going to happen to you. And immediately, boom, it happens. It comes to pass. Now, as you can imagine, this had a tremendous impact on Sergius Paulus. And he was converted, became a Christian. Now, personally, I wonder if Paul pronounced this judgment upon him, upon Elimus, because that's what brought him to the Lord. See, I don't think that Paul was being mean. I think with mercy and compassion, he realized, you're just the way I was until I had my Damascus Road experience. So I believe that he did this to bring him to the Lord, to put the fear of God in him. And let me tell you, that would put the fear of God in you. Yeah. Now, from that time on, Paul was called by his Roman name, Paul, instead of his Hebrew name, Saul. And it's also about this time that Paul began to take precedence over Barnabas. You see, up to this point, this two-man ministry team had been referred to as Barnabas and Saul. Go back and read it. It's always Barnabas and Saul up to this point. But from this point on, Paul began to get or to receive top billing. They became known as Paul and Barnabas. Look at Acts chapter 13, verse number 43. Many Jews and godly converts to Judaism, they're called God-fearers, who worshiped at, everyone knows what a god fear is, a Gentile who becomes a Jew with one exception. For women, it was very easy to convert to Judaism. Why was it more difficult for men? <laughs> they had to be circumcised. And as an adult male, you go, hey, I fear your God. I want to become a Jew, but I don't want to do that. So they're known as God-fearers. All right, everyone with me? Many Jews and God-fearers to Judaism who worshiped at the synagogue followed Paul and Barnabas, and the two men urged them, by God's grace, remain faithful. Now, this happened for two reasons. Number one, Paul was a more effective preacher, so he became the main speaker. Look at Acts chapter 14, verse 12. We're jumping ahead, but you need to understand that at this point, Paul becomes the main speaker. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. In other words, he spoke the majority of the time, and he was a much better speaker. And number two, Paul also seemed to operate more in the spiritual gifts than Barnabas did. So it was only natural for Paul to take the forefront in the ministry. Now, that doesn't mean that Paul was any less important, or I'm sorry, Barnabas was any less important than Paul. It just means that Paul's gifts made room for him. Let me give you a little principle. A lot of people come to me and they say, you know, I don't know what God has called me to do. And so I ask this question. Don't worry about it. Just answer this question. What has God gifted you to do? And the reason I ask that question is, what God has gifted you to do, he's called you to do. And what he's called you to do, he's gifted you to do. Well, mine's all secular. That doesn't mean you can't use that gift for the Lord. And use your influence for the Lord. But you need to understand something. What you're gifted to do, you're called to do. And what you're called to do, you're gifted to do. It's true. Now, we also need to understand another little principle here, and it's this. The best of those who are gifted minister the most. And sometimes in churches, we don't realize that. We just let everyone minister, and sometimes it's like, oh, no. Don't let them sing a special. Oh, no, so-and-so's preaching again. We shouldn't be doing that in the church. Those who are gifted the most should be ministering the most. 
It doesn't mean that we don't allow people to, in a sense, mature or perfect their gifts. But we also need to understand there's a reason why Isaac is leading worship. There's a reason why Pastor Allen doesn't sing specials. <laughs> I'm not gifted to do it, therefore I'm not called to do it. Does that make sense? And even if I was a little bit gifted, I'm still not going to be the one because uh, leading the worship because you'd be going, oh, it's Pastor Allen again. I love him, but boy, he's not good. You just don't do that. And so here Paul is, and Barnabas is a mature Christian, and he realizes, man, every time Paul speaks, people get saved. Every time Paul speaks, the Holy Spirit moves. And as a result of that, Paul begins to take precedence over Barnabas. Now, from Cyprus, they sailed to the region of Pamphylia. And it was here that John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, Paul sees it differently. We're going to find out a little bit later. He sees it that Paul or that Mark deserted them. Barnabas realizes, okay, it's his nephew. It's okay. But he deserts them or he goes back to Jerusalem. Turn to Acts chapter 13, verse 13. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Now, Paul and those with him left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia, landing at the port town of Perga. There John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, look at the map because I want to show you a few things. Down here was Paphos, island of Cyprus. Over here to the right is Antioch of Syria. We're going to find out there's another Antioch. They both have the same name, but they're not the same city. This Antioch you see on the map is Antioch of Pisidia. All right? They now sail to Perga. It is not on the coast. It's not a harbor town. Italia is the harbor town. But they sailed from Paphos to Perga. Now, let me explain a little bit about Perga. Perga was the capital of Pamphylia. And it was not a port town, as I just read. That's not in the original Greek manuscripts. That's why it's italicized, if you notice when I was reading that. In fact, Perga is lo located about six miles inland, but it's located on a river with a deep channel that flows into the Mediterranean Sea. So ships would sail up the river to the capital city. So when it says that Paul sailed to Perga, they did. They sailed all the way up to the river and then up the river six miles until they got to the capital city of Perga. Now, of course, Mark leaving became a very sore point between Paul and Barnabas later on. We're going to skip ahead just for a second for you to see how bad it became, and we're going to make a little application. Look at Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 40. Notice what it says. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return to each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are getting along. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. I want family to come with me. But Paul disagreed. A little bit? No. But Paul disagreed strongly. And Paul is what type of personality? Cleric. Yes. Paul disagreed so strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia. He saw it as he deserted us and had not shared in their work. Their disagreement over this was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and the believers sent them off entrusting them to the Lord's grace. Now, this just goes to show that even mature Christians can have disagreements. I want you to understand that. Would you agree with that? How many of you are married? Yeah. I dare say you have disagreements with your spouse. And you would probably consider yourself mature. And if your spouse is sitting next to you, you go, and you're mature too, honey. This just goes to show that even mature Christians can have disagreements to the point. Now, this is not a good example for marriage. Because marriage is until death do you part. But it's not that way in anything else. 
So they had such a disagreement to the point that they split up. But people, how you split up makes all the difference in the world. Do you act like a Christian when you split up? Or do you act like the world when you split up? When churches split up, sometimes that happens. The question is, do you act like a Christian when you split? Or do you act like the world when you split? If you act like Christians, you're mature. If you act like the world, you're immature. Everyone with me? Usually when there's a church split, three options are there. The first option is everyone acts like a Christian. You split up and you just see it as another opportunity for them to have a ministry to win people to Jesus and disciple them. And the other one sees it as that way and there's a blessing between the two and they work together to build the kingdom of God. Yeah. But sometimes you have two immature groups. So this one goes off and starts rumors and lies and slandering. And this one gets up and begins to retaliate. And they start slandering and backbiting and murmuring too. And the world looks at this and goes, and that's how Christians act. And immature Christians go, I don't like this a bit. I don't want anything to do with the church. Yeah. Or you have the third option. One's mature, one's immature. The immature backbite, they murmur, they slander, they lie. And the other group would like to defend themselves, but God's Word says you can't. And you don't do anything. That's what you do. And I want you to understand, Paul and Barnabas disagreed sharply to the point they split up. But Paul did not slander, did not backbite, didn't do anything, didn't start rumors about Barnabas, and neither did Barnabas about Paul. And as a result, later on, guess what? Mark becomes an invaluable tool to who? Paul. That's later on. Now, from Perga, they went to Antioch and Pisidia. This is a different Antioch than the Antioch of Syria. So look at the map again. From Hipperga, they're going to go, which is right down here, up this river. Everyone see this river? Okay, you might go six miles in and up this river where you see this trail leading. That's where Perga was, Perga. And from Perga, they move on up and go to Antioch of Pisidia. It's in a sense a different place. Now, According to his custom, Paul began preaching in the synagogue. And he was so successful that the Jews became envious of his success. They became jealous. Turn to Acts chapter 13, verse number 14. And then we're going to jump down to verses 44 and 45. But Barnabas and Paul traveled inland to Antioch of Pisidia. On the Sabbath, they went to the synagogue for the services. The following week, almost the entire City turned out to hear them preach the word of the Lord. Wow. Paul was so good the first week that by the time the second week came along, almost the entire city turned out to hear them. But it didn't have the consequences that you would hope for. Notice what happened. But when the Jewish leaders saw the crowds, they were jealous. How sad. So they slandered Paul. They started lies and rumors. Yeah. Why did they do that? Well, it told us. They were jealous. In the original Greek, it says they were envious. They couldn't get the crowds that Paul had. Let me show you something interesting. This won't come up on the screen, but it's great. This is James chapter 3, verse number 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Let me tell you what precedes strife. Jealousy. Almost always. Jealousy. They were jealous, so they slandered Paul. 
let's keep going. And argued against whatever he said. If he said up, they said down. If he said left, they said right. Yeah. It didn't matter what he did. They were against it. And eventually, they ran him out of town. Look at verse number 50. Then the Jewish leaders, this is important. He gives us details for a reason. Then the Jewish leaders stirred up both the influential religious women and the leaders of the city. And they incited a mob against Paul and Barnabas and ran them out of town. They were jealous. They slandered them. And then they argued against whatever he said. And when it looked like, oh my gosh, it's just going to continue on. Then the Jewish leader said, we got to stop this. So they stirred up the influential religious women and the leaders of the city. Now, let me explain what normally happens when you have division and strife. It takes either three people or it takes three groups of people. First, it took the Jewish leaders. They were the manipulators. They were the charismatic manipulators. Then they went to the influential women. Why did they go to the influential women? Because it's usually the women that are well-loved. And the reason the influential women that are loved have influence is because, boy, they're just godly women and they have this. So they went to the influential women. And then what did they do? They went to the leaders of the city. That's the third group. They're the ones who are respected in the community. So normally, when you're going to see some type of split, you're going to see it happen with either three people or three groups of people. First, you've got to have the manipulators. Then you have to have a group of people that's well-loved. And then you have to have those that are respected. And as a result of that, they're pretty um, successful in what they do. Does that make sense? And that's exactly what happened. And they ran them out of town. So then, what did Paul and Barnabas do? Well, they just went on to Iconium. Look at the map again. If you look at the map, and let me get my pointer. They went from Antioch. Travel the trail down to Iconium. Here's Lystra, and then there's Derby, but we're not going to get into Derby. But uh, that's where they went. They went to Iconium, and it starts all over again. Paul preaches, has success. The Jews get jealous and upset, so they run Paul and Barnabas out of town. They head off to Lystra, where Paul heals a lame man. This is a wonderful story. Turn to Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 18, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. While they were at Lystra, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with crippled feet. He had never been that way from birth, so he had never walked, ever. He was listening as Paul preached, and Paul noticed him and realized he had faith to be healed. So Paul called to him in a loud voice, stand up. And the man jumped to his feet and started walking. Now, what happened is Paul had a word of knowledge. Everyone knows what a word of knowledge is, right? If you're taking notes, write this down. A word of knowledge is a supernatural impartation of facts in which the individual has no way of learning by natural means. In other words, you know something that you have no way of knowing in the natural. So let me ask you a question. How in the world did Paul know that the man had enough faith to be healed? He received a word of knowledge. In other words, God told him he just knew that's a word of knowledge. You see, the soul and the spirit cannot be separated. They are two separate, what would you call it, things, but they can't be separated. That's why the Bible many times uses them interchangeably. If someone dies, we'll say their soul went to heaven. And the next time we're talking about it, we'll say, well, they died and their spirit went to heaven. And people get confused. They say, well, is it their soul that goes to heaven and the spirit goes to heaven? Well, the Bible uses those two terms interchangeably because the soul and the spirit cannot be separated, but they are two separate things. That's why the word of God, it can cut as deep to the separation of soul and spirit. Does that make sense? All right. Now, what's interesting is the soul is tripartite. What do we mean? It means it has three parts. The intellect, will, and emotions. The spirit is also tripartite. It has three parts. The first is easy to say. The two other two, you don't really have a name for it. You just have to describe their function. The first is the conscience. That's the first part of the spirit. The other two parts I would refer to as the communicators. When God speaks to your spirit, 
And then the third part is the fellowshipper. Is that a word? That's where you just feel God's presence. God is spirit, and, we, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In other words, there's something you walk in, you feel the presence of God. That's the part in your spirit that you fellowship. Now, what's interesting is these three parts of the soul are connected to the three parts of the spirit in a specific way. Your communicator, where God speaks to you with certain gifts, the gift of word of knowledge, the gift of word of wisdom, the gift of prophecy, it's connected to the intellect. Everyone with me? Let's go a little bit further. The conscience of the Spirit, that part is connected to the will. You'll go, I shouldn't do this. And then your will determines whether you don't do it or you do it. But notice that the part of the spirit, the conscience, is connected to the will of the soul. And the last part with the fellowshipper, I'm just calling it that way, is the emotions. Oh, I so felt God. Woo! Everyone know what I'm talking about? So the three parts of the spirit are connected to the three parts of the soul. So what happens is Paul is preaching. And God gives him a word of knowledge in his intellect he has a way of knowing something that has no way of knowing in the natural because God spoke to his communicator. And his intellect says, that man has the faith to be healed. So let's keep reading. When the listening crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in their local dialect, these men are gods and human bodies. They decided that Barnabas was the Greek god Zeus and that Paul, because he was the chief speaker, was Hermes. The temple of Zeus was located on the outskirts of the city. The priest of the temple and the crowd brought oxen and wreaths of flowers, and they prepared to sacrifice to the apostles at the city gates. Now, you need to know why they were going to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas. So let me give you the backstory, if you don't mind. I'll, I'll kind of be Paul Harvey. So now you know the rest of the story. According to local legend, Zeus and Hermes had come to earth disguised as poor mortal men. And everyone turned them away except one old couple by the name of Philemon and Bacchus. The story goes that after their appearance and rejection of the gods, a flood came and wiped out everyone with the exception of, guess who? Philemon and Bacchus because they did not reject Zeus and Hermes. Because their house was turned into a temple and Philemon and Bacchus were were priest. So when the people of Lystra saw this miraculous healing of the crippled man, they assumed that Zeus and Hermes had returned again as poor mortal men. So to keep judgment from coming upon them, they decided to make a sacrifice to them as a demonstration of their acceptance of them. Now, let's keep reading verse 14. But when Barnabas and Paul heard what was happening, they tore their clothing in dismay and they ran out among the people shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We're merely human beings like you. We have come to bring you good news that you should turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. In earlier days, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, but he never left himself without a witness. What's the witness? Natural theology, in other words, nature, irreducible complexity, the mathematical law of probability, the three laws of physics, intelligent design, etc., etc. Yeah. The reason man invents religions instead of receiving it from the one true God is because God is placed within man. Eternity. In other words, Man knows there's more to this life than this. There's an afterlife. And so they seek a means to do that. And this is what Paul is saying. He says, you know what? In earlier days, God permitted all the nations to go their own ways. But he never left himself without a witness. And then he gives an example. There are always his reminders such as sending you rain and good crops and giving you food and joyful hearts. But even so, Paul and Barnes could scarcely restrain the people from sacrificing them. Now, when again they saw all these people coming to them and they knew what was going to happen, the Jews got upset and they stoned Paul. Look at the next two verses. Now some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium. Here's these Jews again, 
And they turned the crowds into a murderous mob. They looked for someone who was influential and some of the respectable leaders. And they got them on their side and they turned these people who were going to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas, thinking they're Zeus and Hermes, turned them into a murderous mob. And guess what they did? They stoned Paul and they drug him out of the city apparently dead. Now, again, there's a lesson in this. It only takes a few to stir up trouble. That's why God says to mark those who cause strife. Look at Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. And then it says they headed home retracing their steps, which I think is unbelievable, and let me tell you why. If I were Paul... And I got run out of every city I went into, and I was slandered, and rumors were told, and they argued against everything I said. And finally, they stoned me, and everyone thinks that I'm dead. In fact, it's kind of interesting, later on when Paul is recounting all the things that he suffered, he even says he died temporarily from this stoning. They drag him out of the city, and he's revived, and whew, And can you imagine a concussion? Bruises, probably can't see out of his eyes, maybe some broken bones. And guess what he does? He walks to the next city to preach the gospel. And after he does that derby, after he does that, he says, let's go back and retrace our steps. Let's go back to the cities that rent us out and even stoned us. Let's go through them. And as they went through these four steps, they did four things. Number one, they strengthened the souls of the disciples. Number two, they exhorted them to continue in the faith despite tribulations. Number three, they appointed elders in every church with prayer and fasting. And last but not least, number four, they commended them to the Lord. Turn to Acts chapter 14. We'll read it and we'll finish up. Verses 21 through 24. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned, and they're brave, to Lystra, where Paul was stoned, and they left him for dead. Iconium, where he was ran out of town. And Antioch. And guess what they did? Number one, strengthening the souls of the disciples. Number two, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Telling them, remain strong even though there's tribulations. I'm going to tell you this. When you become a Christian, it's not going to be easy street. It's not going to be all roses. You're still going to have tribulations. And we do it for the kingdom of God's sake. Then it goes further. So when they had appointed elders in every church, that was number three, and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord, number four, in whom they had believed. And after that, they passed through Pisidia. They came to Pamphylia. And then finally they went home to Antioch and Syria and they gave a report to the church. You'll find that in Acts 14, verses 26 through 27. And people, that was Paul's first missionary journey. And we look at that and we go, what a success. And it was. It was successful in respect to the souls saved and the churches planted. Boy, I'm telling you, the reason Christianity is where it is today is because of Paul's missionary journeys. And his first journey was such a success. But if we didn't have Paul's personality, let me just tell you, we probably wouldn't be calling it successful. We would just say, lots of tribulation. And the reason, though, they had all that tribulation is because the more success you have, the more opposition you face. Let me tell you, the more God does, the more Satan has to come in and fight it. That's just the way it is. People... I can't tell you how much I love you. And God has great things for you. But let me tell you this. It won't be all roses. But it will build the kingdom of God. And it will have eternal success. And it will bring people into the kingdom. And you will be rewarded for it one day. Let's stand. If you're here this morning, never received Jesus, that's what it's all about.
Doesn't matter that I didn't preach specifically on Jesus. I taught the Word of God. And if you're here this morning and you've never received Jesus, I can tell you what's happening. The Holy Spirit is speaking to your conscience. And it's saying, you're a sinner, you need Jesus. And that's connected to your will, and you have a will. You can either receive Jesus this morning, or you can reject Jesus. I'm going to give you the opportunity to receive Jesus. I'm going to say a very simple prayer. If you believe that Jesus is God's Son, that He died for your sins, that God raised Him from the dead, then all you have to do is confess Him as your Lord, and that's why we're praying. If you believe in Jesus, but you've never received Him as your Lord, I'm going to give you that opportunity. I want everyone to close their eyes, bow their heads. If you want to receive Jesus, just say this prayer after me. God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that my sin has separated me from you. But God, I believe you love me. And because you love me, you sent your son Jesus to die for my sin. And I believe that when Jesus died, his soul went to hell to pay the penalty for my sin. But I also believe when all my sin was paid for, past, present, and future, God raised him from the dead. I believe that. And this morning, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Now, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you said that prayer for the first time and meant it, I want you to raise your hand right now. Anyone at all. No one's looking but me. I won't embarrass you and ask you to come forward. I won't send one to you. If you're online and said that prayer, just type in the words, Jesus. See the hand back there. Anyone else? That's one. Anyone else? All right. Let's give that person a hand. Lisa?